The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 244. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Welcome back to the EL. Today we have Peter, Dr. Peter Vogel, author of Generation Jobless, quite with a question mark, turning the youth unemployment crisis into opportunity. Welcome, Peter, and thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Hello, Wade. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be there. Thank you. Uh, before we dive into your book, Generation Jobless, will you take just a moment to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you personally. Yeah, so my name is Peter Fogel. I'm living in Switzerland currently. I'm Austrian-American by background. Um, I'm an entrepreneur myself. Uh, started a company related to the labor market, uh, HR Matching, eight years ago, where we technically bridged the gap between the education system and the labor market. And uh, having done a PhD studying active labor market policies that help unemployed individuals transition to self-employment, uh, combined with my company, gave me some insights into the youth labor market crisis that occurred over the past few years, um, which is why I took a bit of a deep insight into this topic, which we will discuss uh, in, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so related to the book. But um, yeah, so I started several companies over the past uh, eight years, have supported entrepreneurs, um, starting up companies. I've invested in a few startups. I teach entrepreneurship. I run the Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of St. Gallen, which is uh, a university in Switzerland. So um, all about entrepreneurship, which is why I'm very excited to be here and, and speak with you today. That's awesome, Peter. Thank you for sharing your background. And now let's, uh, let's jump right into your book, Generation Jobless. Turning the Youth Unemployment Crisis into Opportunity, uh, which was made available UK in March of 2015 and everywhere else in April. So not that long ago, just a couple months ago. And Peter, we're going to move quickly. Yep. But our whole goal here today is to really cover those top questions that the listener, the future reader has before they pick up a book and you know invest the time and money into, into reading one. So first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing Generation Jobless. Yeah, so uh, like I already briefly touched on in, in the introduction, I uh, even though I'm an engineer by training, I uh, more out of um, coincidence became an entrepreneur in the labor market. Um, so I, I stumbled upon different different gaps in the market, uh, things that need to be fixed at the transition education system labor market that was one or two years before the youth labor market crisis really hit, which was around 2008 with the, with the financial crisis as well. But there, I already sensed, or we, with my partner, business partner, we sensed that there's something wrong at the intersection between the education system and the labor market. We couldn't really express what it was, but we just sensed there is something going on. And then, um, like I said, through my PhD, uh, where I extensively worked with different ministries of employment all across Europe and around the world, um, I got a bit more of, of the, let's say, academic insights on the unemployment crisis in particular and what kind of solutions might be out there, one of which, of course, being self-employment, entrepreneurship, greatly promoted by politicians all around the world, obviously. And... Um, so I took different angles onto this, and uh, then in, in January 2013, I gave a TEDx talk on entrepreneurship as a solution to youth unemployment, uh, basically. And then I believe two months later, Palgrave Macmillan, so the publisher of the book, approached me and asked whether I would be interested in writing a book on the topic. And uh, then I said, yes, uh, that would be quite interesting. I would be very happy to do so. Um, and uh, yeah, that that's more than two years ago now that we basically agreed on venturing into this. And I said, okay, if I do this, the crisis will not disappear over the course of a few months, unfortunately. So if I do this, I want to do it right and go beyond what most reports, media uh, reports, uh, governmental reports do, which is a very thorough but relatively boring discussion of the crisis itself. But rather, uh, that's also why the title is formulated that way. Instead of bashing a generation saying, okay, you're now branded as generation jobless, you know, I specifically add the question mark to 
you know, is it really the case or do we just have to twist it around a little bit and, and, and make this, uh, you know, every crisis uh, brings with it some opportunities and, you know, what are these opportunities and what do the different stakeholders have to do to turn this situation into something positive? So, you know, I spent roughly two years uh, gathering case studies from all around the world uh, from the different stakeholder groups, may it be uh, employers, educators, policymakers, parents, young people, organizations, whatever not, what can and should they do in order to tackle youth unemployment? And uh, so ultimately, it's a solution-driven book. It's it's very hands-on. Of course, it it, it has the, the conceptual, theoretical underpinning as well. But at the same time, it's very hands-on, very so- solution-oriented. And that that was my real drive that I said, okay, I don't want to write something that is that is purely descriptive and and done by the ILO, the World Economic Forum, and whoever not, the OECDs of this world already. But I want to do something that, that looks at it from a bit of a different angle. And uh, yeah, that was basically the motivation. So Peter, you, you, you touched on this just a little bit, but it's such an important question because thousands of books will come out this month. And, and I want to give you an opportunity to separate yours from the haystack. So what makes your book different from others regarding the same or similar topic? Yeah, so um, surprisingly, uh, there are very few books on the youth unemployment crisis. Um, when I ventured into this, there were uh, we could actually identify none together with the publisher. Now there are like one or two that are discussing this very particular youth unemployment crisis. Of course, labor market dynamics, that's a very general topic that is touched upon in many different books. But, you know, it was quite surprising because the, the vast majority of, of uh, material that is, that is being published on it is, as I said, some reports, some governmental reports, some policy reports, uh, the McKinsey reports, the OECD reports. And then, of course, all the media articles that we can uh, see basically on it uh, coming out on a daily basis all around the world in all media outlets from Economist to New York Times to The Guardian, really all the major outlets are covering this topic almost on a daily basis, but typically on a basis, hey, Greece went down from 60.05% youth unemployment to 58.7%. And this is because X, Y, Z, you know, but, but, you know, it hardly ever goes beyond this kind of uh, dramatic perspective on the crisis. So, you know, um, and I think that in itself is, is this case driven approach, the solution driven approach. Um, I also set up a website, uh, generationjobless.eu or also .org, both lead you to the same page. This will be a solution forum uh, in the end, where where basically people can discuss specific proven solutions, may they be grassroots solutions, may they be top down policy solutions or solutions by large employers that that uh, have proven successful in in actually getting young people into work. So I think this this hands on approach, this solution oriented approach, is really what it sets what what sets it apart and. Um, Ultimately, it's a book that is written for every individual, not just entrepreneurs, not just policymakers, not just educators, but literally everybody who is concerned about the future of the labor market, who is concerned about the future of their children's work career perspectives, and what can they do. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's, it's really written for everybody. It should give everybody some insights that Simply the policy reports and the media articles do not provide. So this is kind of a different question, Peter, and then I'm asking, how, how did you write the book to be read? Is this a book that uh, someone can, can jump in, jump out, cherry picking information? Or did you really design it to be read from front to back? No, it's designed in the following way. It, it's, uh, it's separated into two parts. Uh, and the first part is, as I, as I briefly introduced, more this conceptual, theoretical part in order to give people uh, insights into the book that they would probably not get otherwise in order to get an, a clear understanding of the crisis. So it is sort of a, uh, let's say, you know, a, a theoretical piece in the first part, the first few pages. 
um, because I think that was important to create the basis. So we all know what we're talking about, that we're talking about the same thing, because the problem is in, in every article that you read, you know, we're comparing apples and pears because youth unemployment in country A is not the same as youth unemployment in the country B uh, in terms of what caused the youth unemployment rate to increase in one country. What does it look like and what are the specific characteristics of that particular country? So that this part one is really, you know, kind of the, the necessary basis in order for every individual, no matter what the profession is or uh, the position or whether it's just a parent who is interested in understanding what what is coming up for their children in the next 10, 20 years. Um, so that forms the basis. And then the second part is is basically jumping from stakeholder to stakeholder. Uh, like I said, policy, educators, employers, entrepreneurs, um, parents, organizations, etc. And, and picks up very specific hands-on solutions. So to come back to your question, when you read it, of course, you can read it from page one to the end, but it, you can also very well read it in a way that you read part one. So you get the basis of the crisis, and then you go into the chapter that is most relevant to you, say entrepreneurship or how to change the education system or what do I as an employer have to do or what can I do in order to make it better. Um, or you might as well just jump into those chapters and then you can look at what do the others have to do. Because, of course, the crisis itself is tremendously complex and the solutions are as well. Uh, it's typically at the intersection of different stakeholder groups that the solutions have to be positioned, such as the bridging of the education system and the labor market where we with our own company actually are positioned. It's this interplay of, of these two stakeholder groups that really make a difference. Um, but in addition, there are things that need to be changed on both sides individually. So, you know, it, it, it's really up to the reader. It's written in a, in a flexible manner, in a modular manner, in a hands-on manner. It's, it's, but you, you can understand what is written on page 223 without having read page 125. Mm. that's I guess the conclusion <laughs> so we've dove quite a bit into the content already but I still think there's there's a need for us to to take a deep dive into the content itself so we take the next five minutes and really give this future reader the listener here today a great idea of what your book is all about yep perfect yeah so uh, like I briefly touched upon uh, it's it's broadly structured into two parts with part one um, being structured in in three core chapters. The first chapter is is probably the most theoretical of all in the book, where it's where it's really about understanding why are we in the situation that we're in, uh, where did this whole youth unemployment crisis come from, what are the drivers, what are the causes, which are broadly categorized into demand side factors and supply side factors and then mismatch factors between the two. Um, it goes very deep into the definitions of the crisis, because like, like I briefly said, we're comparing apples and pears if we don't use the same terminology and the same indicators. Because, you know, for example, in Europe, uh, the European government, uh, the European Commission has launched an initiative called the Youth Guarantee, uh, where it's basically trying to push top, ta top down into all the countries one policy initiative to uh, provide job guarantees to young people that don't find employment. However, the problem is that youth unemployment in Spain is pretty much unrelated to youth unemployment in, say, Switzerland. Um, of course, the overall youth unemployment rates are fundamentally different in different countries, and everybody's pointing the finger at Spain and Greece and Portugal and Italy. But quite frankly, if you look at different indicators, um, such as the NEAT rate, which is neither in employment, education, or training, then the statistics show a fundamentally different picture. And the problem is really very fundamental, and it goes down to how the education system is structured. Uh, in one country where, uh, let's say, 80% of young people go into tertiary education, you cannot compare such a system with a system such as Germany, Austria, Switzerland, where you have a very strong dual education system with these 
craft professions that you get trained in. Um, so we're comparing apples and pears. And I think that's really the core of this first chapter, taking a regional approach and understanding what's going on and, and kind of giving an outlook what, what's happening if we don't act, you know, in terms of uh, wasting wasting talents, wasting potential. We're talking one big term is the brain drain, uh, talents from one country leaving the country, uh, creating value, economic value in another country just because they have a bigger aggregate demand for employees. Um, the costs, societal costs, individual costs, economic costs, etc. The effects on the individual uh, all the way through from, from psychological and health well-being to lifelong earning deficiencies, etc. That's, that's kind of the core. It, it, that's, I would really say, is, is the heaviest chapter of all. But I think it's quite important to provide that basis uh, in order for everybody to have this understanding. Chapter two is is much more, you know, it's easier to digest. It's it's less theoretical. It basically gives some insights into who are today's young people, the millennials, the digital natives, what characterizes them, what what is kind of the contribution of this generational change, the technological revolution um, that has taken place, and how does that affect the world of work? How does that affect the individuals? How they work, think, interact. Etc. And and what's what's the contribution to the crisis coming from this generational development? Um, and of course, then what what is happening to the world of work as a result of that? Because um, and, and and that's relevant to everybody who who seeks to employ someone. Uh, may it be a startup or may it be a multinational enterprise? Um, employers need to be ready. Uh, to to create a work environment with with incentives that match the the desires of today's talents that that move into the labor market uh, and and if employers don't understand who they are how they think how they interact then it's very difficult to create incentive structures for them to stay it's we're talking we're always talking about the war for talents and it's about you know despite the crisis paradoxically we we have this war for talents we we have a shortage of talent, and and uh, companies need to create a setting in order to improve the match. Um, and the third chapter, which is the the last chapter of this first part, this introductory part, is the big picture outlook, the trends and the outlook. Where are we going um, in terms of uh, global labor market industries and job profiles of the future? So, w- what's happening? What are the big demographic um, economic trends, so we can see some clear trend patterns, economic shifts, uh, demographic shifts, complexities, technological uh, changes that that basically drive a, a very rapid change in the labor market and also changes the demand from the labor market when it comes to recruiting people into the labor market. So Ultimately, companies uh, um, do do a pretty bad job at understanding what are our skill requirements, not today, not yesterday, but in five years' time. Because most companies recruit for the current need, if not even the need that they had or identified two years ago or five years ago. So they're they're, uh, recruiting lags behind the actual requirements of skills and capabilities. So in order to to bypass that, we need to understand where is the world going in terms of industries, job profiles, job requirements. So that's really this 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 theoretical part. Then the second part, which is then the from the crisis to the opportunity, where um, you know there 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 is a lot of um, content there from these different stakeholder groups, but it's really the the essence of of this second part is the density and and the proof of what is written by by showing case studies. Uh, like I said, there are over 50 case studies from all around the world, uh, from, from every continent in essence. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's really the, the, the essence of this second part, with the uh, fourth chapter being focused on entrepreneurship, so um, where it's about turning job seekers into job creators. So that, that which was also 
actually the the um, the essence of of my TEDx talk back then to say if we want to solve the crisis we need to help young people turn into job creators and and how do we do that uh, and and that really starts at home that starts in the way we train and educate our children in order to become entrepreneurs. Uh, it's in the education system. We need to work with the education system. Um, and, uh, you know, it's basically very hands-on and basically gives some insights, some recommendations, very easy, digestible content on, you know, some, some game-like things that we can do in order to raise our kids in an entrepreneurial way um, and, and what the education system can do. It um, showcases some different scenarios and, and showcases some trends of what has happened over the past five to ten years or maybe even 20 years, uh, the, the prominence of entrepreneurship in uh, the education system. Uh, of course, the, the technological revolution has, has contributed quite tremendously uh, in this regard. So the, the introduction of the Internet has lowered the barriers to entry of entrepreneurship, so we and now from from a more scientific perspective, you know, we 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 can clearly observe that there is a shift in terms of mean age of entry into entrepreneurship. Of course, more young people move into entrepreneurship. Um, so so taking a, a deep dive into what entrepreneurship um, is like as a solution, and uh, then more specifically, how we how we build entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, to foster youth entrepreneurship as such. Um, the next chapter is completely focused on the education system. So what do we need to do in order to make the education system more relevant? The current education system is obviously not relevant uh, to the labor market. That's why we see that employers are not satisfied with what young people uh, have to offer when they leave the education system. That's why we can observe the emergence of trainee programs, for example, because the career readiness, the work readiness is just not there. Uh, companies have to act and they have to react to this unreadiness. It's also a, re a result of the, of the academic inflation. So more and more young people being uh, purely academically trained with um, very little hands-on uh, experience. One example, in the US, um, one 3D printing manufacturer um, has launched the MakerBot Academy where they say we need to uh, provide our children with hands-on training um, in order to, to them not to be too theoretical in what they can do and how they act. Um, yeah, so that's basically... The, the core of chapter five is really what do we need to do from an education uh, system perspective? What are the 21st century skills that we need to teach um, in order to make our children and the young people career ready? Um, the next chapter is, is completely focused on the employers. Uh, so may it be a startup or a multinational, like I said, what is it that they can do and should do in order to help tackle youth unemployment around the world. Um, and it really starts um, with, uh, you know, with the question, with the very fundamental business question, is there a business case for hiring young people? And, it, it, you know, companies think in, in business cases, so, you know, let's, let's make it a business case. And uh, basically discussing different advantages and disadvantages of hiring young people. And... Um, so I'll Peter, I, I, yep. <clears throat> I want to jump in here for just a second because I want to make sure we have enough time for sure. for this next question because you've just covered a ton of phenomenal content with a bunch of context to go along with it. And, right. and this next question, so you're already putting it in a nutshell, and then we're going to ask you to take it even a step further uh, in this next question, which is if the reader can only take away one concept, principle or action item out of everything you've discussed with us today, basically yep. your entire book, what would you want yep. that to be? Yeah, so, you know, it really depends on which angle the reader is taking. You know, if we're talking purely about a business leader, may it be an entrepreneur uh, or a future entrepreneur, you know, I think it's really 
um, the idea of this business case for hiring young people um, as opposed to hiring senior individuals and uh, clearly spelling out, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages of hiring young people and what do employers have to do? And again, as a, as a startup, ultimately, um, you know, you, you are just as much in a hiring need, even more necessary to hire the right talents, uh, just as bad as, as, as the big companies. So, you know, I think it's even more important. We always say that, that in a small company, the essence of a small company is the core team and the, and the initial team and the first players. So understanding who they are and building a strong team around, around the talents uh, that can be recruited is is tremendously important and i think that you know when we're talking about generation jobless or generation lazy or generation uh undecided and all those terminologies you know uh, uh you know what we really forget is that today's youth is a tremendously motivated extremely well educated generation that is very much in favor of entrepreneurship and what we see is that actually also in our activities at the center of entrepreneurship is that so many young people are no longer interested in corporate careers, but they're really interested in diving into entrepreneurship. And many startups don't take enough advantage of this bridging the gap with the education system and and getting access to these super motivated, super well-trained young people. So, you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective, I think it's really um, to to identify the different channels that gives them access to these talents is something. And in the book, I showcase different different scenarios. Over the past five years, we've seen uh, dozens of, of platforms pop up around the world that that specifically focus on um, providing access to startup jobs. Um, mm. Nothing but startup jobs. No corporate jobs. No no consulting, no industry, etc. cetera. It, it, it's really jobs inside startups. And I think this is, this is a good trend. It's an interesting trend. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's really uh, one of the core messages, I guess, for entrepreneurs and uh, uh, future entrepreneurs. Fantastic. So Peter, you did a, you did an excellent job of breaking down your book. I know that's somewhat tough to do in such a short period of time and then to break it down even a step further and, and you did a great job. And, and so the last question I have for you today is we, we don't ask you for any book recommendation. We ask you for the book recommendation. So if there was only one book you could suggest to our, to our listener based on the way that it's changed your life, created an impact, maybe uh, 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 changed your life, uh, your lifestyle or created a paradigm shift. What book would you suggest? Well, there is, um, I, I guess, on the one side, well, for sure, it's uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, um, because it's, um, I guess, every entrepreneur will uh, will be able to to resonate with what I'm now saying. Basically, if you are an entrepreneur, you you feel that you, to some extent, you don't fit in. You are the individual that that criticizes things the way they are. You don't accept them. You want to change them. You're in this constant uh, revolutionizer mode. And, uh, you know, many people that, that don't feel, that don't, don't have this entrepreneurial uh, spark inside them, they don't understand that. And, uh, you know, that, that makes you as an entrepreneur, especially in the beginning of an entrepreneurial career path, you are oftentimes a lonely writer. You, you, you are uh, you know, you're on your own. You spend a lot of time on your own. Uh, most of the entrepreneurs start on their own, not in teams. So, you know, you have a lot of time to reflect on who you are, what you want to do with your life. And we all know the, the, the risks of starting up a business. And so you have all this doubt about yourself, about the choices you have made, whether it's the right career path or not. And ultimately, you know, I think this book, there, there are others out there, but this one in in particular, I guess, Outliers, you know, shows, you know, in a, in a nice way that outliers are there for a reason and it's good that they are there and it gives some justification for entrepreneurs just like other outliers as well. Um, but it, it, it just gives you some comfort, I would say, in in an awkward situation that, that every entrepreneur will go through eventually uh, questioning 
his or her choice. It's an excellent book. And I uh, thank you for recommending it. It might be crazy enough the first time that it actually has been recommended on the, on the podcast over 240 episodes. So uh, that's actually kind of surprising to me, but Peter, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for our listeners to not only get more information on you, but also get more information on your book, Generation Jobless? Yeah, so so as I said, I have a I created a website and I invite everybody to to come and see it and uh, to order the book as well. Um, it's www.generationjobless.eu. So for for Europe, and uh, there you have a direct link to uh, the page of Palgrave Macmillan to order the book. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at P E Vogel. That's my Twitter name. And uh, yeah, I, I, I would be super delighted to hear anybody's thoughts. I've received some great emails from educators and, and entrepreneurs how they said, hey, it's great. I'm actually starting to use your book now to change the way I teach, to change our MBA class, to change whatever or not. And that's super, super exciting. So I mean, for me, the most rewarding thing is to actually see the book being used. So if you use it, uh, you can also send me an email to info at peterfogel.org. And I would be tremendously happy to engage in a conversation and feature your case and solution also on the website. So yeah, I, I look forward to a lot of interactions. Excellent. Thank you for that offer. And, and uh, Peter, more than anything, thank you for coming on and sharing your book with us today. Thank you, Wade, for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing some more podcasts in the future. Thank you so much for listening in today. If you'd like more information on Peter or his book, Generation Jobless, check out the show notes at the elpodcast.com. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.